Johnny here with Simpson Math. In this video, I'm going to do my best <laughs> to walk through the construction proof of the sign sum identity. Okay, most of my students, we have just only begun the verifications, which are, um, they're like proofs where we're proving things in a formal way, but they're maybe not as complex as what I'm, what I'm about to do. In fact, this is probably uh, the second hardest construction proof we'll do all semester long in TRIG, um, but it just fits into the lecture next. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this construction proof. Now I say the word construction because there's going to be an image over here, Oops some triangles and lines, and I have to explain where that image comes from. So I think I'll stay in black, and what I'm going to do is go step by step um, the process for creating an image, a construction. Once I have the construction down, I'm going to notice some things and go through the logic of trying to prove the sign some identity. I have it written right above me. It states, sine of the sum of two angles, we're calling alpha and beta, is equal to sine of the first angle times cosine of the second angle plus another product, cosine of the first angle times sine of the second angle. Now, in a later video, we will apply the identity so if you're looking for that, that's a different video. This video is all about proving it and the construction proof process. All right, let's go through the construction first. I've got a straight edge and a pin, and that's all I have. Those are the only tools that I have available to me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some line. I'm going to draw array AB. Now I'm choosing A, B because I'm going to go in alphabetical order. I'm going to draw my image right here and I'm going to use my steps here. I'm trying to save as much space as I can for the video purpose. But here I go. I'm going to draw Ray A, B right about here. So where I start, I'm calling that A. Somewhere along that line, I'm going to call that B. Now the Alphabetical order has a purpose to it because my instructions over here have to tell the reader how to construct the image on their own. So if I don't have the image, these step by steps or these steps have to show the reader how to make the image on their own. So the very first step is you draw some ray A, B. So it's like I'm starting with A and I'm going to B. And then as I add more and more, pieces to this construction, I'll be adding letters in alphabetical order. So it kind of helps with the step-by-step -step process. All right, so it doesn't matter how the ray is drawn, but I'm doing it horizontally just for my example. Okay, now I'm trying to prove the sine sum identity, which is two angles being added together. So I need some angles. So I'm going to draw another ray. I'm just going to rotate this ray up a little bit, somewhere about there. And I'm going to draw another ray, AC. So I'm just going to rotate to C, I guess. And I've got room there, maybe. Creating angle CAB. Mm, I don't know. Rotate about there. Looks good. So I've just taken that ray, and just like on the first lecture of this uh, video sequence, or the first day of class, where we were constructing angles, you take a ray, you rotate it, that's how you construct an angle. So I just made an angle. I'll label this somewhere C. And so we have created angle CAB. Angle CAB. Okay, I'm going to 
go ahead and give that a name. I'm going to let that angle be a measure. I'm going to call that measure alpha. Another way to say that, I'll do it in parentheses maybe, is you could say the measure of angle CAB equals alpha. So these two things say the exact same thing. I'm just saying I want to, this angle has a name, CAB. I'd like to let it have the measure of alpha. So I'm going to put a little alpha on here. And I think for fun, I'll put it in green. Okay, now I need a beta, and I need a beta in such a way that I have alpha plus beta is one giant angle. So I'm just going to continue this rotation process. I'm going to rotate AB or this AC even more up to, guess what, AB. That's going to be creating angle DAC. I'll put little bullets in here to separate the different steps. So I've only done four things so far. I drew a ray, I rotated it called that angle something, rotate it again. Now I'm going to let that angle measure beta. So I'm going to measure, I'm going to let measure DAC equal beta. I'll go through, I'll label that with a different color. I don't know why, just to give this thing some color. Okay, so like I stated before, if I did not have this image here, these steps should tell the reader what to do in order to create the image. So you draw a ray, you rotate it, it's creating an angle, you call it this. You rotate some more, you call that angle beta. Hopefully it would get a shape like this. All right, continuing with the construction part of this proof, I'm going to draw some perpendicular lines. In a formal, um, like a higher geometry course, you'll learn how to construct perpendiculars, but for this purpose, I claim we can just do something like this, where from D, I'm going to draw a line all the way down to AB, the initial ray, and I'm just going to have a see-through ruler so I can kind of see that horizontal line, I'm going to line it up. So I'm drawing a line in such a way that this new line is perpendicular to AB. Perpendicular just meaning that this forms a right angle. I have a new intersection. I'm going to call that the next letter in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. So I'm going to come off to the side and say, draw D, E perpendicular to Ray A B. Yep. Draw D E perpendicular to A B. All right. So perpendicular line. I just have a uh, right angle. Now the reason I just did that is because I was like I'm trying to get this sine of alpha plus beta. So if you say sine then you must be talking about a right triangle. So notice my right triangle here. I have the right triangle ADE where this angle A, this big angle down here, would be the angle alpha plus beta. So I could talk about the angle of alpha plus beta already. 
it would be defined as the opposite side length DE over the hypotenuse AD. In fact, I'll go ahead and just kind of notice that right now. So I'm changing color just to say I'm saving my black ink for the steps for the construction. I've got some more things I'd like to add to this image. And red, I'll let just be things to notice along the way. So something I want to notice is that if I was asked for sine of alpha plus beta right this minute, I could give you a good definition. It would be the opposite side length of the triangle, DE, over the hypotenuse of the triangle, AD. Now, I really should call this like line segment DE over line segment AD. I think I'm going to drop that notation um, and not be so formal, just because all these lines is going to be, um, I don't know, maybe confusing with all these. They may kind of look like division signs. So I, I may just shortcut this to DE over AD. And what I mean by that is this line segment DE over the line segment AD. Okay, so I, I already have sine of alpha plus beta, but now I need to somehow show that this ratio is equal to sine cosine plus cosine sine of those angles. Okay, in order to do so, I'm going to create some more right triangles, and to do that, I'm going to drop or draw some more perpendiculars. From D again, I'm going to draw another perpendicular, this time to AC. So I'm going to draw DF perpendicular to line segment AC. So this step should tell the reader what to do next. If they have this drawn so far, they should go from D draw a perpendicular line to AC and they should label that intersection F. It was perpendicular so I can go ahead and draw a little right angle symbol to let everyone know that there, we've just created a right triangle. AFD is a right triangle and in fact if I wanted to start talking about just angle beta. Well, sine of beta would be df, and the hypotenuse of that beta triangle is ad. I've got some more perpendiculars to add. From that newly created f, I'm going to draw fg perpendicular to that ab. From f, a B do the best I can here draw a perpendicular line call that intersection the next letter in the alphabet G and be sure to label that that is a right angle it measures 90 degrees one more perpendicular and then I'll be done with the construction aspect of this proof so at this moment you're not supposed to know what's going on <laughs> it is perfectly okay to have no idea why I'm making this image. Hopefully once you've seen the proof in completion, you can go back and start to realize what we're doing. Like I, the proof needs a triangle with just alpha. There's a sine alpha and a cosine alpha. So I need a triangle with just alpha. Similarly, I need a triangle with just beta. I also need a triangle with alpha and beta. So that's kind of what's going on here. But if just uh, if you can follow along with my logic, with my step-by-step -step process, then you're doing good. All right, so I'd like to do one, this one more time. And then I'll put away my black pen because I'll be done with the construction. I'm going to draw from F, FH perpendicular to DE. Okay, so this is the first perpendicular I'm drawing 
horizontally, but I can do this. Do my best to line that up at a 90 degree angle. It kind of cuts through that 90 degree angle. That may come into play later. But I've drawn now F H in such a way that it is perpendicular to D E. I'm going to put away my black pin. The construction part of the proof is over. Okay. And all this black stuff is just that. I claim if you don't have the image over here, you can take these bullets and you can recreate that image from scratch. I can pick up this paper, give it to one of you or a peer of mine, another trig student, and they could follow these steps to create an image that looks like this. Maybe they, you know, started off vertically or something, that's fine, but it'll look like this. Good. Okay. Now, we have this interesting uh, image over there, a construction, and there are some neat aspects to it that I can already start to play with. Everyone in this course should have taken a geometry course back back in the day, maybe a high school setting. So I'm looking now at my original AB and the last thing I drew, the FH. So my original AB and then the line I just drew, FH. How are FH and AB related? I drew AB horizontal. I constructed FG in such a way that it's perpendicular, and then FH in such a way that it's even perpendicular to that. Or how about ED is perpendicular, and then FH is perpendicular. So I claim FH and AB are parallel lines. The two 90 degree angles mean that those two lines are parallel. I'm going to go ahead and note that. I think I'll switch over to blue. Oh, yeah, notice AB. I think the line, the symbol for parallel is that. AB is parallel to HF. Or use words if you're not familiar with that symbol. Okay. If you have two lines that are parallel, here's my purple line, here's my green line, they are parallel, and AC cuts through them. What do we call a line that cuts through two parallel lines? Think back to geometry days. Two parallel lines, it's being cut by a transversal. I'm going to go ahead and say that too. AC is acting as a transversal. That's just a line that cuts through two parallel lines. And hopefully that's starting to ring some bells. If you have a transversal, then you know that the alternate interior angles created by that transversal are congruent. I'm going to say all that. So I think it is safe to say now that angle CAB, the very original angle, CAB, is going to be congruent to angle AFH. Those are alternate interior angles. To help visually, I'm going to put a little green arrow, or a little green um, uh, angle symbol in here. 
so these two angles are congruent. Let's see, so H, F, I'm going to call that C, A, B, and angle A, F, H are called alternate interior angles and therefore they are congruent congruent um, is, means a little bit different than equal congruent means two angles have equal measure so that green angle up here, angle AFH and angle CAB are the same measure. And we let angle CAB be alpha. So we could label this as alpha, but I'm not going to. But they are congruent. They have equal measure. Okay. That's fun. That's, that's fun. <laughs> I like that. Okay, that's that's kind of his own little thing. So I'm gonna let that be blue, and blue is retired. Let me pull out a purple to talk about something else. And the something else has to do with this triangle up here, HFD. All right, we just label, uh, labeled AFH this little green part. Well, the green part and then this purple part. Let me go ahead and just put this in purple. I'll do it with a double line. What do we know about that green angle and the purple angle? Angle AFH and angle HFD. Well, hopefully you can see that they make up this right angle. So the green angle and the purple angle add up to 90 degrees. We have a word for that, complementary, complementary, complementary. They add up to 90 degrees. Okay. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Oh. Well, let's now focus, zoom in on just the triangle. D, H, F. It's got a right angle, and it has this purple angle. What do I know about this high angle, angle D, or I guess angle HDF? What can you say about that high angle and maybe this purple angle? Well, the purple angle and then this high angle up here, they have to add to 90 degrees because that 90 plus 90 will give us the 180. So I claim that the purple angle and this high angle are also complementary. Wait a second. This green angle and this purple angle add to 90. And then this purple angle and this high angle add to 90. Well, then what can we say about the high angle and this green angle? If these two are complementary and then these two are complementary, I think those two angles must be the same. I think they are congruent as well. Let me put that all down in words, and I'll switch over to a different color. I'll go over to purple. Let's see. H, D, F. That's what I call the high angle, but I'm going to say it here. Angle H, D, F, and angle... H F A are both congruent to the same angle. I'm sorry, both complementary to the same angle. That is angle, the purple angle, H F D. I think I've said it twice, but I'm going to say it a third time. 
get my head wrapped around it. Okay, angle HDF. That's the high angle. The high angle and angle HFA, which is this little green angle here. The high angle and the green angle are both complementary to the purple angle. Meaning they both, both those sums add to 90. So I claim that because they're both complementary to the same angle, then they have to be congruent. It's just logic follows. They've got to be congruent. So I think it's safe to now say this high angle is congruent to this green angle. So I'm going to use my same green pen to say these two angles are the same measure. That's, I think, technically the transitive property. If you say, let me grab scratch paper. If you say A plus B equals M and let's see if I'm doing that right. B plus C equals M. No, that's not quite right. That's a transitive property. Let's see. A a plus B. Oh dear. Oh, record and cut that up. So, so they are congruent. I'll just kind of put some. Um, notation here. I'm going to put angle HDF is congruent to angle HFA. So I feel comfortable putting the little green symbol up here. Those two angles are congruent. All right. And because it's congruent, I'm going to go ahead and uh, label that high angle as angle alpha. Or I'll say the measure of angle HDF is also equal to alpha. I'm going to go ahead and put a little green alpha on my construction. So I just did a whole lot of work, this blue stuff and the purple stuff, just to get my alpha to be up there. You'll see why in a few more steps. Okay, so I constructed the thing, I noticed some stuff, I noticed some more stuff, did some labeling. I'm going to notice some more things now. I'm running out of colors. Let me grab an orange. Something I want to notice is now looking at line segments. You see this DE, line segment DE. Would you agree DE is equal to DH plus HE? HE plus HD would equal the entire thing DE. All right, all right, all right. All right. I think you agree with me. I think you. I think you. I think you get it. Those two line segments, they're on. They're just right there. And they would equal that that total. A piece plus a piece should equal the total. Okay. Something else to maybe just look at while I'm here. H E is the distance from H F to A B. H E. I claim that maybe it's the exact same as G. F. Those two line segments are the same. So if DE equals 
H D plus H E, then maybe I could say D E equals D H plus F G. Let me put that down just to make sure we're all on the same page. In fact, let me just go to a new sheet of paper. All right, something I want to notice. Line segment ED is equal to DH plus HE. And then I claim HE is equal to FG. So I'm just going to make that substitution. So ED is equal to D. H plus F G. All right. I think I'm ready to go back to the very first thing I noticed, which was I was trying to set up sine of alpha plus beta, and it's equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I'm coming back to this. Oh, but I just talked about DE. DE, or ED in this case, ED, is equal to the sum of DH plus FG. I'm going to come back to this notice, and I'm going to replace DE with something it is equivalent to. I'm substituting. Recalling that, and then I'm going to sub in something that DE is equivalent to up top. All right. Well, now I have a binomial on top of a monomial. That's just a fraction that I can take and split apart. Just copy that down. Equals dh over ad being added to fg over ad. Now, this is a formal proof, so I should maybe be doing a little bit more better job of justifying along the way. So, I'm going to put a bullet here. That's the next thing I noticed. Um, I just went through and said he is the same thing as fg. So, maybe I'll just say that. Uh, obvious, <laughs> obvious, or look at construction. And then I'm going to recall that, and that's all I did was recall it. And then here I said DE is equal to DH plus FG. Mix up the letters, but, and that's just from that right there. And then here all I'm doing is I'm splitting that fraction apart. If I wanted to add these two fractions, they have a like denominator, so I would just add them together. So I'm just taking that adding fraction step and reversing it. I'll just leave that alone for a little bit. Okay. Um, well, this next part may seem like magic, um, but I'm going to go through and I'm going to multiply by a very judicious form of 1. Just a very fancy one that's going to make everything come together. So this is a step that we have talked about in verifications, where if you need something, you can put it there as long as you multiply by 1. 1 doesn't change the value, it just changes what it looks like. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to multiply by a very fancy 1. The DH, I've got to refer to my notes. I'm going to multiply by FD over FD. Now, what in the world is FD? I don't know what it is, but when you do top and bottom, it would reduce to 1. So this is a form of 1. But what is FD when in our scenario, 
for FD is this line segment. What is that line segment? Um, well, if I'm just looking at the beta triangle, it's the opposite. Maybe I need that. Or if I'm looking at this alpha triangle up here, it's the hypotenuse. Hmm. So FD, though, that value is what I'm multiplying the fraction DH over AD by, top and bottom. This second fraction, FG over AD, I'm going to multiply by a different one. This one, I think, is AF over AF. Okay, well, okay, I guess that's 1, because anything divided by itself is 1. But what is AF? Just reminding myself. AF is the line segment AC, but cut off at C, or cut off at F. So AF has a different, a few different roles. If you look at just the alpha triangle, AF would be the hypotenuse. If you look at the beta triangle, AF would be the adjacent. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now, hopefully you agree with the legality there. I guess here I can say multiply by... I'm going to go ahead and put the word fancy on there because it is pretty fancy. Fancy one. Now in my next step, I promise we're almost done. In my next step, I'm going to play around with that, um, the commutative property of multiplication. You can, you know, switch things around. DH times FD is the same thing as FD times DH. 2 times 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. That's the commutative property of multiplication. I'll direct it now. Commutative. And let me look to my notes because I want it to fall into place exactly right. Oh, you know what? I'd like that one to be over there. So I'm also going to do some addition manipulation as well. Um, so addition is also commutative, meaning 3 plus 2 is the same thing as 2 plus 3. So I am also going to rewrite the fractions, and I'm also going to <laughs> rearrange the multiplication. A lot of manipulation in that step. I want that FG to be the first thing I write down, I claim. FG over, and I'm just going to rewrite these factors in the denominator. AF, that's being multiplied by AF over AD. Plus, I'll continue writing this down and then I'll make sense of it. I want the HD to be there. Yeah, the DH. DH over FD times FD over AD. I think that's going to work out. Okay, so let me walk through that, that, um, all that manipulation. I probably should have broken that up into two different steps. So first things first, I just took the addition and I swapped it. So um, 3 plus 2 is the same thing as 2 plus 3. So I've just interchanged those, putting that uh, addition with the FG out front. I also rearranged the uh, denominators. So notice I have the AD times FD. Well, I just swapped those down here. No, that's a lie. Yeah, it's over here. So I just swapped that. So I have the FD, then AD, and then over here, I took my AD and AF and swapped those. So I just swapped the addition, and then with my factors, I just interchanged those. Okay. I, I did that for a reason, I promise. Let's see. I think we're almost done. Let's talk about what these ratios mean in regards to my construction. Let's focus in on FG over AF. FG represents this side length, and AF represents that side. So I have FG over 
AF. That's a side length of a right triangle over the side length of a right triangle. That is trig talk. In fact, we're talking about the triangle with alpha, where FG is the opposite side length and AF is the hypotenuse. What choke function relates opposite to hypotenuse? Sine. FG over AF is the same thing as saying sine alpha. I'm going to make that substitution. Sine of alpha. If I asked you for sine of alpha, you would tell me FG over AF. Now we have AF over AD. Well, AF has that same line, but now we have AF over AD. AD is now talking about this line. So I'm no longer looking at the alpha triangle. It looks like I'm looking at the beta triangle. AF over AD. AF over AD. Well, if this is the beta triangle, then AF is the adjacent side length, and AD is the hypotenuse. So that must be cosine beta. Hopefully you see now where this is headed. DH over FD. DH over FD. Okay, this is talking about that tiny triangle up top. DH over F. D. Let's say that right. D H over F D. D H over F D. So this is talking about the little bitty triangle with an alpha in it, and D H is acting as the adjacent, and D F is acting as the hypotenuse. So this must be cosine alpha. Notice we had to use a different alpha. We had to do all the blue talk and purple talk to make sure that this angle was alpha. So we could talk about cosine of alpha. So it's a lot of work, but it's paying off. Lastly, FD over AD. FD over AD. That's the opposite of the beta triangle and the hypotenuse of the beta triangle, sine beta. So sine of alpha plus beta is equivalent to sine of the first times cosine of the second plus cosine of the first sine of the second. Ooh, that's pretty rough. That took me 43 minutes. <laughs> All right. I, I present this because I have to. It's, um, we're going to be using the sine sum ID and the other sum of difference identities moving forward. We're just going to accept this now as true and move forward, we're, and we're going to accept the other sum and difference identities as true and move on. And my students, you will have to prove something on your next like major assignment or test, depending on what class you're in. And in this um, proof writing, I'm going to give you several options. I think there's going to be six total. And this is the very first one that I'm giving you. It's the hardest one. It's the most complex. I don't really expect any of my students to do this 40 minute long process, but it is an option. If you have spring break coming up or fall break coming up or just a weekend that you have the time to do it, sit down and start to memorize, start to walk through this. Make sure you understand this proof. And maybe you can write this up for me, present it as your um, proof. But you'll have other options, and they're much easier, much faster, I promise you. So uh, here, though, was the construction proof of the sign sum identity. All right, is there anything else I need to say about this before I move on? Um, oh, again. I'm not expecting you to be this creative. This took us thousands of years to come up with. <laughs> so I don't expect you to be uh, creating this. When I say I want you to prove something, all you need to do is mimic, emulate, um, copy what we've already done. And this is the very first one. So don't stress too much. They're going to be a little bit easier. 
but just notice my notation, my process. I should have maybe put in here. I got a little bit too happy, but just all we did here was substitute maybe a little block box at the end to say I'm done with my proof. All right. I think that's all I wanted to say in this video. I'll see you in the next video when we start to use this identity and the other sum and difference identities. Put them to use.